Now it's time for the honorable mentions. For Don Bluth, I decided to do something special. I'm not going to talk about the stuff that he did at Disney in detail, nor talk about just one thing. What I'm going to do is more like a mini look back, if you will. You see, not only is Don Bluth a legend in the animation industry, but he's also a legend in the video game industry. Yep, for the honorable mentions, I'm going to talk about Don Bluth's video game career. Now let's go back in time to 1983, when Don and his new company, Bluth Group, released their most famous game, Dragon's Lair. If you guys want to know what is it about, then listen to this guy. Dragon's Lair, the fantasy adventure where you become a valiant knight on a quest to rescue the fair princess from the clutches of an evil dragon. You control the actions of a daring adventurer finding his way through the castle of a dark wizard who has enchanted it with treacherous monsters and obstacles. In the mysterious caverns below the castle, your odyssey continues against the awesome forces that oppose your efforts to reach the dragon slayer. Lead on, adventurer. Your quest awaits. If you suddenly have the urge to play this game, then you can go pause this and go nuts. Remember to come back here, though. Anyways, it all began with an idea from the president of Advanced Microcomputer Systems, Rick Dyer. He got it when he was inspired by the text game, Adventure, and he made something that he liked to call the Fantasy Machine, which allows the game to have narration and still images. I know it may not sound much, but for the early 80s, that's like some weird voodoo. In that machine, there was a game that's called The Secrets of the Lost Woods, and when Dyer tried to market it, nobody, and I mean nobody, was convinced it would work. Then, when he watched The Secret of Nim, he suddenly got an idea what his game needed to attract the crowd. Good animation. As Dawn would accept the project, he wanted to put the graphics level at full max for his animation to be clear. Now we understand that making a game is much more different than an animated film, and Dragon's Lair is no exception. Bluth discovered that what makes a game so intense is speed, so he would go focus more on the tempo and editing of the game instead of story and characters. The budget for this game is around $1 million. I'm not sure if that's a lot or not in early 80s video games, but I know that in early 80s animation, that's pretty much chump change, and I think Dragon's Lair is considered more on the animation side of this. Because of the budget, they couldn't afford having a live-action model for Princess Daphne. Which, by the way, I gotta say this, I find that she is the hottest fictional character ever. Seriously, I throw out Jessica Rabbit to get to Daphne. So what's the secret of her divine beauty if she didn't have a live-action model? She was inspired by pictures in Playboy magazine. Giggity! Oh, and also people, there's nothing wrong with finding a fictional character attractive. Anyways, another thing about the budget was that they couldn't afford voice actors either. They had to bring in people from the crew to do the voices, like sound engineer Dan Molina was the voice of Dirk, the head of assistant animators Vera Lamfer was the voice of Daphne, and animator Dave Spafford was the voice of the Lizard King. The only voice actor they could bring in is Michael Wright who was the narrator that you heard before. During production, everything had to be kept in secrecy. They weren't allowed to talk to anyone about it, not to co-workers, to family members, nor friends, just so that there are no spies around stealing the project from them. Something that's similar to when Don's crew worked with Steven Spielberg. The game is considered as the first video game to have stereo sound. When it was in the arcades, the sound would just alternate from one speaker to another. Kinda like in Fantasia when they had Fantasound, the first surround sound for those who are new to animation lookback. When they were selling it to arcades, there was a problem. 
it was about twice as expensive as a normal arcade unit, costing at $4,000. What was the solution for arcade owners to get their money back? Double the price to play! Instead of paying the usual quarter, players would have to pay 50 cents to play the game. But wait a minute, wouldn't that price scare customers away then attract them? Well, in case that's true, they decided to give the players the option of playing it for a cheaper price, but could only access through certain areas of the game instead of all of it. When it was released in arcades on June 19th, 1983, it was an incredible success! It seems that everyone wanted to pay 50 cents to play the game, and some units would get around $1,000 a day. It was so much of a success that Pioneer, the company that made the arcade units, had a really hard time to keep up with the demands of arcade owners who wanted to get their hands on one. Because of the hard demands, arcade owners considered these units rare. So, they gave it the Hollywood treatment by having a red carpet and ropes leading to the unit. If you think that's crazy, there were some that even put a giant screen TV over the unit for everyone to see. And if you think that's crazy, there was one arcade owner that turned his arcade into a movie theater to watch a guy play Dragon's Lair. Imagine if that's still happening today! What would be the highest grossing film of all times? Avatar, Titanic, The Dark Knight, two guys playing Mortal Kombat against each other? Anyways, at one point, there were rumors spreading around that there are secret levels and moves that Dirk could do, and even a way to accidentally kill Daphne. Now, there are two reasons why these rumors exist. One is the opening. When people play the game, they notice that there's no sequence when Dirk enters the castle. There was one, but they removed it because the makers thought it was too slow. And two are the publicity materials. People also noticed that scenes shown in test screens weren't in the game either. But same as the first reason, the makers thought those scenes were too slow, so they removed it. So, in short, with those two reasons, people thought that those things were still in the game and thought that there might be more than just that. On September 8th, 1984, there was an animated series of the game by Ruby Spears Productions that lasted for only 13 episodes. To this day, Dragon's Lair has been ported to almost every PC and console there ever is, even in modern consoles like the Wii, PS3, Xbox 360, the iPhone and iPad, Nintendo DS, PSPs, even DVDs and Blu-rays! A year later, they released Space Ace. It's about Ace, who got zapped by the Commander Borf, and now he's turned into a wimpy teen called Dexter. Not only that, but Borf even captured his girlfriend, Kimberly. So now Dexter has to stop Borf from taking over the world and save Kimberly. Now there is no way in hell that this story could be more cliched than this. Anyways, the biggest goal for Dawn on Space Ace is to make it the most incredible game that the world had ever seen, even more than Dragon's Lair. During a test in Lair, people complained that it was too hard and they had no idea what to do. To solve this problem, they went in Space Ace and added flashes to point to the player where to go or what to do. But to keep it a challenge, the flashes would appear in like a microsecond. The result ended up being much better and they later on added that to Lair. For Space Ace, Dawn focused more on the story and characters so that it could feel like a mini-movie than in Lair, where there are some random scenes that had nothing to do with the story of the game. Originally, at the beginning, Ace would start out as Dexter and then would gradually evolve to Ace. But the writers felt that teenagers would rather be related to an adult. so. They started the game with Ace, and then he got zapped down to Dexter. Like in Dragon's Lair, they couldn't really afford having voice actors. So, they brought in some of the crew to do the voices, like Ace was voiced by animator Jeff Eater, Dexter was voiced by animator and storyman Will Finn, Kimberly was voiced by animator Lorna Pomeroy, and yes, she was once John Pomeroy's wife, and Borf was voiced by an electronically altered Don Bluth. 
making it his first and possibly only voice acting role. He said that even though he liked his performance, Don would have rather gotten Paul Shenar, who was Jenner in The Secret of Nim, to be Borf's voice. Another person who was considered to voice in Space Ace was comedian Eddie Dezen for Dexter, which would have been really ironic since later on, he would be Mandark in Dexter's lab. When it premiered on October 1983 in the National Game Show in New Orleans, it didn't go well as planned. Gamers had mixed feelings about the game, saying that it was way too fast and way too hard. Also, arcade owners were concerned about why do they have to buy a new unit to get Space Ace. You see, when they were trying to sell the units for Dragon's Lair at $4,000, they convinced the owners that they could switch the laser disc that contained the game inside for another. So they thought that for the next games they'll make, they'll just sell the laser disc at a small price. When it did hit arcades on April 15th, 1984, it really didn't get a lot of quarters. Now, the main reason of this wasn't because that arcades weren't buying the units or that there was major competition with another game. It was because of the infamous video game crash of 1983. For those who don't know what it is, here's the story. In 1983, during the Atari 2600's sixth birthday, they released two little games called E.T., based on the Steven Spielberg movie, and Pac-Man. The games were so terrible that even to this day, gamers consider them as some of the worst video games of all times. But it was also two of the best-selling Atari games of all times. Soon after, any company that had a product started making games to promote their products like Kool-Aid and Purina. They didn't care if they were good or bad, it was just something to make money out of people. And because that bad game after bad game was hitting shelves, people started to care less about them and stopped buying. The sales went way downhill and companies like Coleco and Mattel quit the video game industry because of it, leaving Atari and the entire video game industry almost going out of business. It wasn't long until Nintendo would come in and save video games as we know it with the Nintendo Entertainment System. I'm telling you, at this point, I don't trust E.T. anymore. Not only did he overshadow amazing films like The Secret of Nim and The Dark Crystal, but also is one of the causes of the Armageddon of video games. He's evil, man. Trust me on that. Anyways, back on to Space Ace. While it was in the arcades, there was an animated series based on the game as part of the Saturday Supercade show, once again, by Ruby Spears Productions. However, like Dragon's Lair, the cartoons would last for only 13 episodes. Today, Space Ace isn't in many different consoles as Dragon's Lair, but it is still in some current ones like the PS3, the DS, the iPhone, and the Wii in part of the Dragon's Lair trilogy game. When Space Ace was released and people were disappointed, Don and his crew told his people to make them feel better. Don't worry guys, the next game we're making now is the sequel to Dragon's Lair, which we know it now as Dragon's Lair 2, Time Warp. The story is about Dirk and Daphne after the first game, where they're now married and HOLY CRAP THAT'S A LOT OF KIDS! WHAT THE FRIDGE PERSUADED DIRK TO RAISE SO MANY OF THOSE- That makes perfect sense. Anyways, one day, Daphne got kidnapped by an evil wizard named Mordrock, and he tries to force Daphne to marry him. So now Dirk has to cross dimensions to stop Mordrock, and once again, save Daphne. I know technically he's going through different time periods, but that's not what's happening here. It's not like in Turtles in Time where they go into a linear time zone in actual places, no 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 no. In here, Dirk has to go through Wonderland where Dirk is Alice, the Garden of Eden with a fat Eve, in Beethoven's study where Dirk is as big as a mouse and then... This happens! Even before he would go back in time, Dirk has to escape his own mother-in-law! The work for Time Warp all started right after the major success of the first game. 
now that Dawn understood the speed in video games and can make a linear story in one, this time he wanted to make the game more playable, like something that even if people finish the game, they'll still come back for more. An example of what Dawn wanted to do for this is to add in golden treasures to collect throughout the game so the player will go through an easier ending than if you don't collect them at all. In the final result, however, the crew decided to remove that idea and make you go through the harder and longer ending anyways. As for the treasures, now they're necessary to collect because if you don't collect them all by the last level, then you would have to go back to the levels where you didn't collect them. Another thing Dawn added for replay value is that the player would have to do a move at the end of the game to have a happy ending. If you didn't do it, then Dirk and Daphne will crash and die. <laughs> For the voice acting, they brought in the original voice actors slash crew back, and this time, they hired legendary voice actor Hal Smith to be every other character that wasn't in the first game. Even the mother-in-law. You better fight my daughter Speaking of voices, this is the first time that we would hear Dirk say something. Originally, there was supposed to be a level where Dirk was in a pirate ship. Storyboards were already made, but there was a problem. They lost the model of the ship, and it was something that they really, really, really needed. So they decided to just not do the scene entirely, but the storyboards did end up appearing in some books and the Blu-ray of the game. Even though the crew was excited to make the game, Something went horribly wrong. On March 1984, Cinematronics, the company that funded the Bluth Group since Dragon's Lair, had filed for bankruptcy and could no longer fund the group, most likely because of the crash of 83. Dawn hoped that something good would happen to them so they could go back to work, but the last straw came in when the company was having a liquidation sale and an auction to get rid of all their units of Dragon's Lair and Space Ace they had left on July of the same year. Soon after, the Bluth Group went bankrupt as well. As time would move on, the crew would continue the animation of the game, and it was done around the late 80s. When it finally was released on June 16, 1991, Eight years after the project began, it was a major failure. How bad was it? Well, I don't know. There's nothing that I could find that tells me how bad it did at the arcades. But you might be wondering, if that's the case, then how do you know it did badly at the arcades? Well, I do have a theory about why. Listen up. This game was released in 1991, right? In terms of video games, that's the time when there was a big battle between Nintendo and Sega with the NES and the Genesis. Pretty much, everyone owned either one or the other. So with those consoles, who really needed to go to the arcades when you can play the games at home? Also, it was during the time before Mortal Kombat came in and brought people back to the arcades, and was just out a few months before the Super Nintendo. Plus the fact that nowadays, some people don't even know that there's an official sequel to Dragon's Lair. So, it all adds up to Time Warp ended up as a bomb in the arcades. Today, there are still ways to play this game in modern consoles, but not as much as Space Ace, like the iPhone, the Wii on the Trilogy, the DS, on DVD, and 1 in an 8th Blu-rays. Why 1 in an 8th? Well, not only it has its own Blu-ray, but the first scene is also playable in an Easter egg of the Blu-ray of Space Ace. Now at this point in time, I think we all know by now that Dawn and the Gang were too busy making films in Dublin, Ireland. So let's move forward a little bit in 2002, when they released Dragon's Lair 3D, Return of the Lair. It's pretty much the same game as the original, but now you're in a 3D environment and you take full control of Dirk like in an actual video game. 
But not everything is in 3D. The makers of the game also created two all-new hand-drawn animated cutscenes for the opening and the ending of the game. They also used cell shading on the graphics to give it a hand-drawn feeling that the original had. When it was released on November 17th, 2002 on the PC, November 18th on the Xbox, December 22nd on the GameCube, and March 26, 2004 on the PS2 in Europe, it received some okay to mixed reviews, saying that the controls are bad, but it's still fun to play. Then, a year later, Bluth and Goldman were called to do the cinematics for the Namco game, I Ninja. Then, in late 2004, Digital Leisure released Dragon's Lair 3 for the PC. It's not actually a real Dragon's Lair sequel. All they did was take the gameplay of Dragon's Lair 3D and turn it into a game that's like the first two predecessors. However, the critics just hated the game so badly, saying that it's a waste of time and money. Then, in 2010, Don and Gary joined up with Michelle Bizarro to make a video game company called Square One Studios. Their first game made was Tapper World Tour, based on the 1983 video game classic Tapper, where you're a bartender passing out beers to a huge crowd of customers from all over the world. In there, Don and Gary were in charge of both the art and the animation. When it was released on March 16, 2011 for the iPhone and the iPad, it received a lot of praise saying that it sticks to the original very well and that the addition of the specific drink to the specific customer adds in a new challenge. In conclusion, Don Bluth is recognized as one of the most important people in the animation industry. Not only was he the first man to go against Disney and actually beat them in a battle of animated films, but if it hasn't been for him, Disney wouldn't have pushed that extra mile to try to beat Don at his own game and release such classic films like The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and The Lion King. In a way, Don Bluth was one of the people responsible for the Disney Renaissance. He always said that he wanted to save animation during the 80s, and that's exactly what he did. And let's not forget about Gary Goldman, who's like the Luigi of the Don Bluth films. And now, to finish it off, I'm going to count down the top 10 best Don Bluth films. And by the way, this is not counting the shorts, Bartok the Magnificent, or the games. Here we go, number 10, A Troll in Central Park, number 9, The Pebble and the Penguin, number 8, Rockadoodle, number 7, Thumbelina, number 6, Titan A.E., number 5, All Dogs Go to Heaven, number 4, An American Tale, number 3, Anastasia, number 2, The Land Before Time, and number 1, The Secret of Nim. Well, that's all I've got for Don Bluth. Join me next time, and I'll talk about everyone's favorite desk lamp. See you later, dudes.